I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Karen Lawton, co-author of the book The Sensory Herbal Handbook. The book popped up on my radar after I spoke to Nicole Rose in episode 57 and to be honest I bought it without really knowing what it was about and I read it whilst lockdown was at its most strict and at a time when although I didn't have a lot of spare time on my hands I perhaps had a few more hours during weekends when I was at a loose end and had the time to explore plants in more depth. Reading the book and following some of the exercises in it made me realise that although I look a lot at plants every single day I don't really see them. If you want to take your appreciation of plants to a deeper level, this episode is a good place to start. I started by asking Karen how she and Fiona Heckles, her business partner and co-author of the book, got started in herbalism. So I have to begin here by explaining that I met Fiona while I was studying a phytotherapy degree at Middlesex University in North London. And we... We recognised each other as kindred spirits and we studied together and played making potions together because the four-year BSc degree course was incredibly scientific. It was very, very left brain. And in that entire four years of herbal medicine training, we went outside once on a herb walk. And we kind of counteracted that by doing as much outdoor and nature connection together as possible. And sensory herbalism is our style of herbalism. It's what we've codified over the last 20 odd years working together. And it's following the plants themselves. So through our own observations, we've looked at the plant parts that come out and we've connected them with different elements and different body systems. So we've basically been led by the plants. We've watched the plants, and for example, right now is summer, and there's loads of flowers around, and we connect the plant parts of flower with the sun and the fire elements and the cardiovascular system and blood. And then as we move into autumn, we're looking at the plant part of seed and the element of air. And in winter, the plant part of roots and the element of earth. And then back round to spring when the fresh green leaves burst through and it's the element of water. And each one of those works for us because we're following the plant's journey. Whereas a lot of other systems of herbalism is actually based on our human body the human response when you look at kind of theories of medicine which are which are all valid and really important but C and I are we're quite rebellious and we like making things up for ourselves so that we can understand it and truly connect with it and it's just been a very creative fun journey and we've had a really good time working with the plants and people over the last 20 years as I said and the the book that we've written, the Sensory Herbal Handbook, has that whole system within it, which has been really exciting to release out into the public domain and uh, have lovely feedback from. Yeah, it's really interesting what you said about y- your course where you didn't actually interact with the plants. And that's really, I think, pertinent because when I read your book, I'm a gardener, so I spend, you know, hours and hours a day outside with plants but there still is an element of not actually looking I'm I'm kind of looking but not seeing the plants and what I got from your book was to take the connection that I've got already with plants and take it to an even deeper level and it's incredible what you discover and how much you actually feel like you get to know the plants personally through working with them in the way that you describe in your book. Um, and I think one of the things that you recommend is that people keep a herbal journal. Um, so 
it, maybe I thought that perhaps you could pick out perhaps one exercise that people could do if they were interested in doing that. Obviously, they need to get the book, but you know, just perhaps one thing that you think is a really good way of starting people connecting with the plants on a deeper level. Yeah, of course. And so the journal, an idea that you've got a book that's your personal book about your relationship with plants. And anyone can do this. It's a very, it's creative exercise really about deepening your observation skills. Um, one of the first things that people often say to us when we suggest a journal and doing some kind of artwork around a plant is, um, oh, I can't draw. No, I can't draw. And that, that, that puts a real block. Um, there's like a natural block that happens and it might have happened from, early childhood from school from not being given enough space to actually create without being told that's not good enough or put down in some way. Um, so we like to begin things with drawing exercises and just simply doodling. Just simply doodling is a very good way to improve your artistic and creative literacy, if you like. And um, we really like to suggest to people to choose a plant. So, for example, the common daisy that's out and about in everybody's lawns. If you just sit down and have a look at that daisy and let your pencil get onto a piece of paper and without taking your eyes off the daisy, just draw. So you're not invested in what your drawing looks like. You're more invested in observing the daisy and potentially trying to count the petals and trying to make enough petals around the the whole flower. And then you can progress, if you want to, to really taking a step back and making it a meditation, a meditative exercise, where you're trying to cre- recreate the plant on a page. And it is not about what it looks like on your page. It is about your observation and connection with that daisy. Mm. And that kind of work, then you can just start making notes around the daisy. You know, just simple notes of what you've seen or observed in that time. And it's something that my 12-year-old um, has been drawing daisies this week and she has been so delighted watching the daisy head close as the sun goes down. It's something that like brings some kind of bubbling up of joy in her and me and I'm sure many of us when you watch the flower's head close. But it's something that not everybody knows or notices, that opening and closing, the movement of the flowers or watching the daisy track across moving the daisy's head to, to follow the sun through the day and they're the kind of notes you can add around your drawing you know I watch the daisy's head close and I notice the tiny little pink stains at the edges of the petals and I actually texted one of my friends when I first got into daisy and the word daisy in predictive text comes out as fairy mm-hmm. um, you know, and that's the kind of thing I noted in my journal that these these are fairies not only in the history of mythology, you know, when people have created daisy fairies, but in our modern technological era, their predictive text <laughs> changes them as fairies. You know, and your journal's for you, and that's the most important thing. It's not for anyone else. It's your personal plant connection experience journal. Mm. Yeah, and it is really, it is really powerful, as I said, and it's, um, it's almost a, it's a meditation. It's a, a kind of exercise in mindfulness, as much as it is about documenting any, you know, useful information about the plant. Um, so I thought it was also interesting. You write about um, making a connection with the plant and also using intentions when you use those plants. Um, do you think that makes a, a remedy more powerful? And if so, why do you think that? Yeah, I mean, I I believe that having a connection with plant from the very beginning makes the medicine more powerful. And I guess I've been brought up to 
believe so. My grandma um, was a gardener and she was she was a green fingered witch really and she taught me that you speak to your plants, you sing to your plants and the importance of love in all the relationships. And then the plant the very, very first remedy I ever made as a young child was rose water in from her garden. And each of those roses had their own personal story and history that my grandma told. And then every time we applied the rose water, we used to use it as a facial tonic. You know, it had that wealth of story within it. So I was putting love on my face to, as an astringent tonic. But when, when I create medicine now, a lot of the medicine that I create, I know the birth of plants because I collect the seeds as a gardener as well, I'm a horticulturalist, and I've got my own lovely seed bank in in a shed in the garden. And each one of those seeds, when I plant them, I hold them in my mouth because I I don't know I don't know where a lot of this comes from, so I can't deeply into the science so I feel that by putting my saliva on a seed it begins a relationship that the plant knows me from that moment I put it in the earth that a lot of my compost in the garden again comes from our food scraps we've got a wormery so it's it's kind of the material fabric of it all and I love the soil and as that plant grows I talk to my plants. When I water the plants, I often think about the remedies that I'm going to be creating from them. And when it comes to the harvest, there's always a moment. So as I harvest plants, it's part of a ritual. And I choose the right time, whether it's to do with the lunar calendar or biodynamics. And then an intention is formed. So for example... Today, I'm going to be harvesting and um, my oats have already gone to seed really early and I'm, I'm going to be harvesting some oats and those oats are for a particular remedy that's for the nervous system. We call it maximum chill. Um, and as I harvest the oats, I'm thinking about the nervous system, how those oats nourish the myelin sheath around the nerves, support us with B vitamins, and I speak to the plant saying thank you for growing and please make some medicine as potent as possible and help people to be calm, relaxed and free from anxiety. And I've looked at, I've looked at, you might have heard there's a, a scientist called Emoto and he did loads of work on water and he did, his work looked at the crystal structures of water after monks had prayed over the water or it had been left in a subway station and he was showing the intelligence of these molecules of water so sometimes I like to think of it as the plants are full of water as we are so by communicating with them the molecular structure changes and provides some kind of magic (laughs) some kind of magic but you know, I fully believe in the power of intention and magic. And it's another form of language that goes side by side with scientific um, discovery. Because each of these plants, I'm also fully aware of their phytochemistry, each of the different compounds that are in these plants that elicit physiological changes in our bodies. But I believe it's part of the whole that the science and the magic is integral to the whole of herbalism and herb craft and we've kind of gone down a bit of a left brain path in society right now where science is king and the dominant way of doing things and it's a shame because it's much nicer to balance in my personal experience Mm. Mm. Yes, I think we definitely have gone down that route. I would completely agree. Um, maybe to the exclusion of conversations like the one we're having, um, which, you know, I don't think is a good thing. Um, so 
what if somebody was out and about in their garden at the moment and i think this episode will go out in around the middle of july um what might be something that people could go and harvest now um and what might they use it for so the um, that height of summertime the heather is flowering and that beautiful purple and sometimes white flowering shrubby tree really it's a miniature bonsai tree the heather is a fabulous remedy that we make an oil from and the heather the oil that we make gets combined so if you've got heather in your garden or around in the woodlands or moors where you are where you live um one of the first harvests i ever did of the heather was up to Godore, a mountain in the lake district and it's such a amazing incredible color when you're out and about and you see these kind of hills of purple very very attractive but you can strip off the flowers of the heather which are already very very dry and so they haven't got a high water content they're quite easy to dry for tea and heather is a urinary antiseptic fabulous for any kind of gestitis that can come about especially in the height of summer when people are dehydrated we see lots of cystitis and simply drunk as a tea and because it has an action on the kidneys and the kidneys are really this organ of elimination and excretion letting things out and go and and when there's stagnation or a, a stop of flow there we can see arthritic conditions come up so heather's a fabulous plant to help with joints as well and as i said i'm turning my heather into an infused oil so i'm putting those flowers into a jam jar covering them with some sweet almond oil and i leave those out for one lunar cycle a month to properly infuse all of their medicine into the oil and then that's something that i turn into an achy balm which is a fabulous um, joint and muscle rub with other herbs like comfrey and horseradish, rosemary and peppermint. So, yeah, there's the heather. That's what I recommend. Hmm, <laughs> lovely. Um, that's, um, a lot of people don't grow heather now um, in their gardens so much, mm-hmm. which is a shame because when it really is in full flow, it's actually just stunning. Um, but It, kind of... it is a stunning. Yeah. We, we grow it with our with our bilberry patch because it's another ericaceous um, plant, and it the bilberries and the heather, the blueberries love love growing together. Mm. So we've got them in the garden underneath the a pine tree. Oh, nice! Yeah, that'll do it for your acid soil. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, and so, obviously, people have been going through quite a lot emotionally um and i don't see the kind of turbulent times ending anytime soon um so i thought Mm -hmm. it might be nice to to perhaps talk about something that people could um create that's good for relaxation and and calming is there anything that you'd recommend for that yeah i mean lemon balm lemon balm's a lovely plant melissa and it's very easy to grow part of the mint family so you've only got to worry about her escaping and spreading boundlessly through all of your garden um but lemon balm makes a lovely calming tea really easy to just pick a sprig of fresh balm make a simple herbal infusion by covering it with boiling water it's good when you're making an infusion with aromatic highly scented plants that you cover it so not the steam doesn't escape so I'll put a sprig of lemon balm in a cup, cover it with um, boiling water and then put a saucer on top, letting it brew for 10, 15 minutes. And then all of those volatile or aromatic oils are kept into your drink. And simply drinking that brings a sense of calm. It's an anti-anxiety herb. It's uplifting and very safe. The only place I would say there'd be a contraindication is if you've got an underactive thyroid. It can trigger. If, if I drink lemon balm every day 
for a week or so, I get a bit of a goiter. My thyroid comes up. But it's totally safe in other in all other ways. And it's fine for me to have one or two cups. It's just if I drink lots and lots of it. Mm-hmm. Another herb that's lovely to grow is verbane, verbena. And verbena officinalis is the medicinal verbane. And again, very calming and relaxing, slightly bitter to taste. So all of these make nice, simple infusions. And what I'm doing with the oats that I'm harvesting today, I'm making a oat seed tincture, and I'll then mix that with a verbane, verbena, a verbane, and a lemon balm tincture. And we call that our max chill drop. And they mix so well together, those three herbs. Really nourishing for the nerves. Cool. Okay. Well, that's um, that's very helpful. Um, I was just thinking about my final question, um, and I might amend it a little bit because I was going to ask you about, um, you talk about the importance of community um, herb gardens, um, and I was going to ask you, know, you know, kind of why they're important and how we can go towards or work towards establishing more. But then I thought about it, um, and I wondered why we'd actually lost them in the first place. Um, I interviewed uh, Julian Hoffman, who wrote a book called Irreplaceable, and he talks about um, the American Indian Center in the States where um, a group of Native Americans have re-established um, a medicinal garden using a lot of the, the prairie plants and the plants that are you know, common to, to them um, to be used medicinally. Um, and I just thought, why why did we ever lose that connection? Could you even hazard a guess at that? Well, losing connection. I know, because I've established a community orchard in my village, and when I was um, looking into the orchards and looking for funding and grants, I learned that I think it was a huge number, like something like over 80% of the UK's orchards had been um, kind of co-opted for agricultural land um, or building land in the past, since the war. And it just made me think about the growth of agriculture and the growth of cities. Um, And actually this morning I went for a walk to my local nature reserve. It's a Wildlife Trust nature reserve and there's a, a planning submission to build 160 houses on that green belt. So I guess land and nature have become looked at as a commodity to be bought and sold um, because we're living in a capitalist society. Um, So I'm just having a guess that that's what's happened to a lot of our old community um, physics gardens and wild spaces. And what, what we know by lots of different research is that by gardening together we release all kinds of positive hormones and chemicals and we feel good we we release endorphins by the hard work of gardening and creating something together brings a real sense of achievement Fiona and I have been very lucky to set up community gardens in various different places and we always call together a volunteer force And the volunteer force that meet become a family. They're people from all over that often don't know each other. And after two, three days of hard graft, creating gardens and planting together and bringing seedlings from wherever people live, people and eating together, it just becomes like a real family unit. And that's what we've seen with our community gardens projects that when people work together grow food and medicine together they take care of one another to a different level and the sharing that goes on it's 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 quite humbling because we've got various different whatsapp groups on our phones for different community gardeners or sensory herbalists and especially through this current crisis We've just seen this 
beautiful generosity of sharing. So many seeds and seedlings have been posted all over the land for people over the last few weeks. And um, medicine created and shared. And just this sense of compassion and kindness that is often so lacking in the dominant narrative. You know, I was I was actually thinking this morning, I think when I was a child, um, there was this newspaper headline that went all over and it was on the news that Prince Charles talks to plants. And I remember people talking about it around me and ridiculing Prince Charles. And I had the, I think it was the first time, I must have been about 10, it was the first time that I thought society was mad and really insane because my grandma, as I said, she brought me up talking to plants and I thought, oh, this is nice the, the Prince Charles talks to plants and everyone else around me was like, oh, he's, you know, they were saying negative things about it. And I realised that the narrative that, that the dominant society has has no respect for nature and you know, it's very upsetting. It upset me and it still upsets me now. Walking around my nature reserve this morning, there's a thousand year old holly tree there. It's one of the oldest hollies in the land. And I stood with it and I thought, you know, I cut if they if they cut you down to build houses, that's more than a travesty. That's just it's awful. And part of me knows that that is what society demands. That is the way capitalism works. If there is an ancient woodland in the past of the high-speed railway, which there has been and has been cut down very recently, that's what goes, and it's at the expense. It's at the expense of all our health and sanity, and it's, um, it's something that C and I are intense and passionate about changing. And all our work is focused with the intention of reconnecting people to their local plants and by doing that we really believe that people will start changing their perceptions and attitudes to nature Mm. so yeah (laughs) well yes good i mean bravo i i hope it does um it was interesting what you said. Well, two things really interesting there. The first thing when you said about your, your grandmother speaking to plants, the first thing that pops into my head and always does is the story about Prince Charles. Um, you know, that's just burned in my brain from childhood, um, that story. And I don't think he's ever kind of, you know, gone. I don't think anyone's ever got past it. I don't know, like you said, what the kind of problem is with it, but it's definitely something that's stuck and it's something that has he's been ridiculed for, for sure. Um, and the other thing that I thought was interesting was it almost kind of came full cycle when you said about community gardens and people sharing plants and that went back to actually your grandmother's garden because most gardeners will can walk around their garden and the, the, the plants that have a special place and the plants that they'll stop and highlight to you are the plants that somebody else has given them and they never forget that connection so it's about I suppose having shared plants which then make the plants significant which then means you're more likely to protect them so but without having that kind of community and the the connection between the people and plants that's why I suppose we don't fight for the spaces that are getting destroyed Mm, yeah yeah that's it so I think we've all got a duty to revive this connection of sharing that used to be the norm in my grandmother's time when I moved into my house that I live in now I had an elderly couple next door and they were so generous my garden was devoid of of life at that time it was just brambles it wasn't devoid of life it was full of life but it was full of wild bugs and um, they helped me clear it and they gave me so many plants and like you say I walk around my garden and I look and I know who who's given me who's gifted me each of those plants and I also know who has the the new generations of some of my cuttings and plants and where they are in the land and what soil their roots are in it's a it's very special isn't it gardening yeah it is brilliant well Mm -hmm. um is there anything that you want to say or to mention about your work um as I said I can put stuff in the show notes but if you you know you're welcome to share anything that you're up to at the moment 
thank you. I, all I'd like to say is if anyone has any questions or comments at all about herbs and herbal medicine, please do get in touch with us through our website, which is sensorysolutions.co.uk. Thanks to Karen for taking part in the interview and thanks to you too for listening. I hope you can forgive the noise in the intro and outro, but I've got all my doors and windows flung open because it's so hot this week. And I've got sparrows in my porch who I think are fledging and they're really creating a racket. I'm just looking out on my garden as I record this and I can probably tell you where most of the plants came from and the people I bought them from, even if I can't remember the names. Sometimes the nursery people I bought them from or the person who gifted me a cutting linger in the memory a lot longer than the cultivar name proving just how important the human associations behind plants can be. I have a rose growing up my shed and I've no idea of the variety, but I call it Mrs Brown's Rose after a customer I had years ago, as this rose was grown from a cutting from her garden. I spent hours pruning and deadheading the original plant in Mrs Brown's garden and it was her pride and joy. She wasn't the easiest character to work for, but one day after criticising my pruning for the umpteenth time, I told her I could prune the shrub in question to the best of my ability or I could go home. It was her choice. From that point on, we built a great relationship that lasted until the last time I visited her in a nursing home a few weeks before she died. And although she couldn't speak, a huge smile spread across her face when I took her hand. So treasure your plants and the people who give them to you because really the two are inseparable. So this week's Bug of the Week with Dr Ian Bedford is on what Ian refers to as summer snowflakes. If you don't know what they are by their name, I'm pretty sure you'll have seen one. Sometimes called summer snowflakes, the cabbage white butterflies are a common sight in our gardens throughout the warmer months each year. And for many people, these delicate insects are a joy to watch as they chase each other through the sky like trailing kite tails, or feed from summer flowers like lavender where they'll sway in the breeze like little white flags. But alas, the pleasure these butterflies bring some of us is often offset by the frustration and despair that their cabbage-munching caterpillars cause others, the gardeners and the growers, who toil each year to produce their homegrown vegetables. Cabbage white butterflies actually comprise of two species, the large and the small white. However, there's a few other white butterflies in Britain that could easily be mistaken for them. So catching and killing the adults should never be an option for controlling them. However, if left alone, Their caterpillars, particularly the large whites, can soon destroy not only the cabbages, but most of the other brassicas that are being grown as well. Since each caterpillar, as it grows and matures, will consume leaf material equivalent to around 27,000 times its final body weight. So what are the options for controlling them? Well, despite the availability of chemical pesticides for home use, None of these are specific to cabbage caterpillars and might therefore harm beneficial wildlife. And besides, many people grow their own food in order for it to be chemical free. So the simplest and most environmentally friendly alternative is to securely enclose brassicas within a netting that has large enough holes to allow water and light through, but not the adult butterflies, and to ensure that netting is in place before the butterflies first appear and that it's at least two inches away from the plants, or they'll easily lay their eggs through the holes and onto the leaves. However, if netting isn't feasible, then just keep an eye open for when the butterflies first start to fly around the cabbages, since these will be the females who will have already mated and are now searching for the plants to lay their eggs on. Landing on the underside of suitable leaves, the large whites will quickly lay clusters of around 50 bright yellow eggs, whereas the small whites will lay pale yellow eggs, singly, and usually alongside a leaf vein. So from this point onwards, turn over and inspect the leaves every two or three days, and remove as many eggs as you can by rubbing them between your fingers. Those that are missed, though, will soon hatch into little caterpillars, which are either yellowy green and speckled with black for the large white, or velvety green for the small. But these two can easily be removed by hand, or left as a much sought after food for the garden wasps. Failing this, just grow plenty of nasturtiums, as they're a great alternative for cabbage white butterflies to lay their eggs on, or 
for relocating the caterpillars collected from the vegetables. And then, perhaps those summer snowflakes will be back in your garden again next year. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.